actually talking, so that's why you Right. <laughs> I didn't want to talk. Good morning. It's good to see everyone this morning. I want to welcome you to worship Fisher's Point Community Church. If you look around you at the pews, you'll see our connect part. We want to make sure that you take notice of that. If you have suggestions, ideas, want to volunteer for something, have a prayer request, you can write that on the back and we'll be glad to get that to the church staff. A couple of quick announcements before we begin this morning. Our shepherd collection uh, item this month is microwavable single serve entrees. These are really helpful, particularly in the summer, to the kids that we minister down to, um, down at Shepherd and Indy. So we want to bring those in and uh, get those out to the back, and those will be delivered downtown. And our Here's the Point youth will meet tonight at the Landing Mansion from 6 to 8. <coughs> Pizza will be provided. Bring a snack and a drink to share, and we'll have a lot of fun. Lene is going to come and share scripture with us as we get started. Romans six eighteen. You were made free from sin, and now you are slaves to goodness. Yeah.
don't think you should put anything in the plate as it goes by. But if Fisher's Point is your home and you have not given online already, it's your opportunity to support what God is doing here in the church. So let us pray again. Father, we thank you and praise you for being with us on the stormy days, on the sunny days. We know that we can count on your presence and your power at work. We pray that you would bless the cheerful givers today. Help us to uh, use your funds wisely to be a blessing around the world and here at Fishers in Jesus' name.
we promise not to pray. I, I hate to be bragging to this, but uh, in my day, you know, I'd strap on them uh, diesel engines. I didn't want to do that. And those 18 wheelers, you know, no problem, especially if the engine's running and put it in gear. Uh, but I've been known to pull both and almost got run over a couple times. Uh, but anyway, I can still do that because my wife is letting me make Lego engines and Lego wheelers <laughs> if I be real careful. <laughs> but my Father in heaven, my God, has uh, blessed us with specialists. He doesn't always work miraculously. And that's not something I anticipate seeing. I see miracles out uh, every day, you know, yeah. truly birds flying and, and being able to breathe. Those, those miracles are there. And to have him think and just stop and fix me with a miracle, hey, he sent all these people down here and they've got a job to do. And I just wanted to say thank you for the miracles of the pharmaceutical and medical community and uh, their willingness to take us under their wings, so to speak, and to heal us at the best they can. Yes. And uh, the last I've been under is like a spinal block. Mm. And uh, I, it, it blocked, I don't want it, I don't want to block, <laughs> but uh, I feel good, I feel fine. And thanks for letting me testify, praise God. Absolutely, praise God, absolutely. Sometimes the miracle is just getting us to the right person. Amen. And God revealing to them who it, um, and what's going on with you. Um, and, uh, you all have heard me testify about that with my mom. So I have to go over that again, but she's doing really well. Um, had a shunt implanted for hydrocephalus that was causing major problems for years, and nobody knew what was going on until she got here and God led us to the right neurologist who said these 12 symptoms. I think you have hydrocephalus and you need a chunk in your brain. Yeah. And she had the surgery and two months ago and she's walking and talking and doing well. And I'm so grateful. God is so good. Yeah. Question. Karen. Uh, I thought I'd give you a quick update on my brother in law, yes. Roy. He um, kind of went through all this throat surgery where they cut him from ear to ear for. Uh, things that they saw there and he had that surgery and he's home with all these foods can't you know eat food can't talk all that kind of stuff so little by little boy it's my sister really learning how to be a good nurse <laughs> um, but at one point you know they they did do a biopsy no cancer there praise the lord praise the lord praise the lord and uh but after he was home several weeks all of a sudden he was in a panic. They had to call the ER and or call the you know the ambulance. And he got to the hospital. The doctor checked him out. They knew just what to do and had to do another surgery. Not quite as difficult. But the doctor tried to explain to my sister what it, he felt like at that moment. And he said, "You've heard of in the wars and the torture procedures of waterboarding. So that's what he felt like." Mm -hmm. felt like he was drowned. But they got it fixed. Just like Lynn said, these experts, they got it fixed. And I'm telling you, when I get pictures of him, he looks like he's been on the beach for five months. You know, just tan and his beautiful silver hair and everything. He looks great, but he's still in that process of healing. Mm -hmm. The opening that they made there is still having to heal a while before they do all the work where they go in and they put in this little understand what it is when it's you know like a voice box or something mm -hmm. and then he'll be able uh, hopefully to speak so he's still on the mend but he's still got the joy of the Lord on his face and in his heart and he's just he's a miracle he's an absolute miracle just awesome. like the other miracles we've seen and I'm surviving his illness so thank God for that <laughs> Sometimes that's the biggest miracle yeah. of all. Yeah. Sometimes we have to work on being friends at home. <laughs> but uh, we've seen God's goodness. We've seen his hand move, even though we'd like it to move faster. Right. You know, and I heard uh, a lyric this morning that on the way to church that God will send out an army in the middle of the night to rescue us. Yeah. And I believe that. Yeah. I believe that. Praise God. 
the Lord. But I 
opening me prayers. Yeah, I'm scared. I'm not scared. I'm very concerned. But I, I mean, I can't let fear take over my life. But I do ask that you pray this week. I've got two doctor's appointments, and I don't know what I'm going to expect. But I know that I'm going to leave it at God's feet in, his, in the palm of His hands till the storm passes over, which I've got so many of you I've been praying for because I've had a lot of downtime. <laughs> and I want to tell you today, in front of my husband, I have the most wonderful husband who is taking good care of me and put that smile on his face even though yeah. I know he's concerned. <laughs> I thank you, God, for him. But just pray for me this week. We'll get through it. And my mom's doing great, so she's been on her own doing fine. <laughs> but, uh, just pray for me this week. Sharon, would you like to take that around and pray for you? Just sit where you are. Anybody that would like to just gather around Cheryl and ask that when you pray. I know her. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Father God, you are the God of power. You're the God of healing. And you want to give your children great things. And today, Lord, we just ask that, that you be with my mother. Because, God, you are the great physician. Yes. And we already claim victory just as uh, your, your uh, children marched around the walls of Jericho yes. with not any clue that victory was coming. But just by your promise, they knew it would. Yes, amen. And Lord, we just ask that you help us to have the confidence to blow, get ready to blow the trumpets for victory. Yes. Amen. yes. And we just ask in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit that you just cover her today. Amen. Cover the family, cover the doctors, even those doctors that don't believe, show them a miracle. Right. They can't explain it. Amen. And Lord, we just ask that you be with her, give her peace. Lord, we love you today. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Lord, we bring before you the God, Jill. Lord, we thank you for your presence with each of them, struggles that, that they're facing now, the loss of loved ones, physical health. We thank you for Lenny and Karen for raising money up and just all the good in, in his life as well. We thank you for Mike and Lord, the answers that we believe are coming. For the specialist that he will see. God, you're so good. You're so capable. And we love you. We praise you. We give you all the glory for miracles that have happened and are happening that are going to happen. And we trust you for them in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to share our scripture with us um, this morning. But before I do that, I just want to sing just the chorus of the song we're going to sing after the message, just to give you a little taste. This is for How I now have I now become your enemy 
by telling you the truth? Those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. It is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, not just when I am with you. <coughs> My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone, because I am perplexed about you. I have been struggling today because, um, so I've been preparing this passage that she just read, and today I was in Sunday school and it ruined it. <laughs> so I'm just, uh, I'm, 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 yeah, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And I'll tell you what I mean is that I, I was reading the passage of scripture for Sunday school, and in the middle of it, I just fell impressed. This is what I'm actually supposed to be preaching on. But then I came here and I said, no, no, maybe not, maybe not. I want to go the easy route because I've already prepared this over here. And I think that there is a place for both of them. Um, I just have felt the Lord impress on me that we need to hear this. So I want to get you in the mindset for a minute of the people there in the early church. You know, the disciples listening to Jesus, they're walking around with him. And so he's, tell, he's talking about this new kingdom that's being brought, that is right now, and that is coming. And this kingdom is not the palaces, it's not the walls, it's not the catapults, whatever they used back then, I don't know. It's not the power in the, the human sense. But here they are, and I want you to imagine this, that you're one of the disciples. He's talking about this powerful kingdom. But they're looking around and they're seeing things like weaponry, Opulence, power. I can only imagine that that seems so discouraging. That Jesus is saying, hey, don't, don't worry about it, guys. This new kingdom, although it's not going to look like this. Wait, 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 hold on. Why won't it look like this? It's not going to look like this, but it's going to be in you, through you, and around you, and and it's all this kind of lofty stuff that we don't really understand, all right? All these words that he's using, it's like, okay. And, and I'm a disciple back then. I'm nodding my head and smiling like, oh, okay, good, good. So anyway, when are we going to get this? Every parable, every single one, actually, every parable that Jesus gave to his disciples was about the kingdom of God in some form or fashion. And he's trying to explain to them, like, okay, well, let's use farming, or let's use uh, fishing, or let, let's use building, or let's use, uh, you know, being a shepherd. Well, let's use that for, for you to kind of start to wrap your mind around it. And Jesus is giving them little tidbits each and every time. Like, hey, uh, you don't understand the kingdom because it doesn't look like all of this here. Um, but let me give you a little bit of what it's going to be like. they didn't get it. They would nod their head and smile. You know, like, okay, good, good. But if someone were to come up to a disciple and say, well, what, what are you following this for? And I, he keeps talking about this kingdom. I'm just going to stay with him long enough to figure out what this is and then probably bolt after that. Or maybe I'll stay if it sounds pretty good to me. Some were wishy-washy. Some were really kind of deeply implanted in this kingdom. The kingdom of God, this concept, is something that I preach about a lot. But it's something I still don't get. I'm supposed to stand up here like the expert. Okay, you're the kingdom of God, I say. But it doesn't look like this. So, kingdom of God, Jesus is talking to them, they're seeing opulence. And they think, well, why can't it look like this? So I want you to invert your mind for a minute. Invert your thinking for a minute. What if Jesus were to tell us that the kingdom of God is going to be awesome today? Some of us might say, well, why can't it look like this? Others might say, is it going to look better than this? 
Can it please look better than this? And the inverted thinking would think, well, how, with everything going on around us in our world, how are you going to fix it? How are you going to fix it? I mean, look around. Not even an act of God can fix this. And the discouragement that we have with people we know who are not saved, or with people, we, we look at governments that are, you know, Please pray for Haiti, by the way. They just had their president assassinated. It's causing a lot of ruckus and a lot of riots and all those kind of things. We, it, it, I can imagine a Christian in that environment looks around and says, how could it get any worse? We never want to say that out loud, right? How can the kingdom of God fit itself into this? Because you know what scripture says? We're, we're not on an escape plan here. Right? We know that that's what scripture says, right? A lot of us Christians, me and myself included, many times, we're just like, hey, I'm just acting good till I can get out of here. Now I worship Jesus so I can get my fire insurance, but then I'm out. <laughs> right? It's our escape plan. The whole world is burning around us, but we're like, hey, I've got, I've got the antidote here. I'm out of here anyway, so y'all can just have your stuff. Um, no, the kingdom of God is coming here. Right. And then while we're here living, if it was just an escape plan, I'm not saying that heaven's not going to be great, we're going to be there, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be better than this. Of course it is, of course. So don't, don't hear me saying that, that there's no heaven or something weird like that. What I'm saying is that heaven overlaps with here. If we live heavenly here. And we are bringers of the kingdom here. It's within us, it's around us, it's within us, all that stuff. I don't preach on that anymore. So, so the discouragement factor would come in when we say, how can God fix this? With his kingdom, quote unquote, that he's talking about. This doesn't, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So, so in, in Galatians chapter 4, was what the one that originally I was preparing, you know, Paul was talking to these Galatians, and he was so concerned, just like, just like Jess read a minute ago, just so concerned about the things that they've been doing and learning. He, he's been using, throughout this book, he's been using different tactics to get across his concern. First, it was just like, hey, quit, quit doing what you're doing. This is, this is crazy. So these people are coming in and teaching you, hey, that stuff that you heard about grace and faith and, and forgiveness and mercy and all that stuff, hey, that's great. That's, it makes you feel warm and fuzzy. But hey, you've got to make sure that you're doing all the rituals that a Jew would do in order to get, get you where you need to be. You see, these people that he was preaching to were Gentiles. They weren't raised in, in, in Jewish tradition. So they come into this fresh and new, and they walk up with just sincerity, innocence, and they say, well, what do I do now? I knew what we were supposed to do a little while ago. This is what you know, Paul was talking about in Galatians chapter 4. Before, when I worshipped these pagan gods, and nothing ever came of it, by the way. But it was just a mask for control for the Roman government, you know? I knew what I was supposed to do there, maybe have uh, some idols, maybe... You know, I would give a lot of money to the government, and that seemed to really appease the gods, you know. And and we would have fruitful harvests. And I'd get more land, or maybe a servant. But Paul was telling them, all of that that you were doing before was false. This is not, okay, this is where God's connecting with him. I, I'm kidding. This is not the kingdom that's going to be overarching, overpowering, and it's going to be the powerful kingdom. So now we go to Mark chapter 4, and this is the parable I read today in Sunday school that just struck me. It just floored me. And I'm going to read it. So, disciples, I'm going to give you the context. The disciples are with Jesus, following him around, these crowds are following Jesus, by the way. And here he, he starts to speak in parables. And he spoke in parables because the people who were really deeply involved and committed, 
got what he was trying to say. And the other ones, they just said, okay, well, that's a nice story. Move on. So Mark chapter 4 says this. That again, Jesus began to preach or to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in, and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore of the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in teaching he said, Listen, the farmer went out to sow his seed. As long as, as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell along the rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched. And they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell along thorn, among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. So I'm going to stop right there. He's talking about this parable of, of the sower is what we call it. And he's talking about three different kinds of seed that fell. One, uh, they just kind of fell off the path. Nothing really happened. Two, one that fell in rocky soil. Oh, it sprang up pretty quickly. But because it didn't have anywhere to take deep root, it, the sun just came along and scorched it. There was, no, there was no depth to it. Couldn't get much water. And then there was a third one. It went into the good soil, and it got such deep root that it actually started producing new plants from it. So we have, what we found out later is that this is a parable for distributing the word, the word of God. So there are some who were just kind of indifferent, eh, you know, it's a nice story, whatever, you know, get on with it. And then there are others, who I want to focus on today, who are others who it takes root, but then it stops. And the, the, the first sign of discouragement or disruption kills it. And then we have the third one, good soil, good cultivation, good water, you know, good irrigation, all of those kind of things deep in the soil. And it doesn't just get big for itself's sake, but it actually produces more from it. And I think what we're seeing here is God trying to tell us that the purpose of us getting deeper in his word is not just for us. Oh, we love that though, don't we? We love that warm, fuzzy feeling, prayer and, and, and reading scripture and getting deeper in scripture. But we learn more. But if we're just on the rocky places, by the way, reproducing is getting deeper in the soil. If we're just on the rocky places, how many people and how many times have we experienced this, that the slightest sign of disruption, of discouragement, of someone hurt my feelings, of, oh, you know, all of these things happening has just sent us off course. Like, I don't think I want to have anything to do with that. And we walk away. God never said this Christian life was going to be without suffering and it was going to be perfect. But he said that he's coming here to make us perfect. You know? Sometimes we get into this mentality that this, these passages, these stories, these, uh, this, this cultivation in our life is just for us so that, like I was saying earlier, we can earn our fire insurance, we can go to heaven, there, there you go, and uh, we can get out of here as soon as anything happens, and we, we start talking about pre-tribulation, post-tribulation, what, whatever, we start talking about these theological terms so that we make, make ourselves feel better so we don't have to experience suffering. But what the Bible is telling us is, yeah, let's put that aside for a minute. Hey, can I tell you about the kingdom of God? 
The power behind that? He's telling us that, yeah, 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 okay, we can talk about all those intricacies later, but what I'm telling you is that there are people out among you who are dying, who are withering from the inside out, and all they need is for you to help them to get deeper roots. Because growing in the Lord is not just for you. And we see this throughout all of Scripture that God looks at the spiritual life, not only of the individual, but the spiritual health of the community. Back in ancient times, like it was just a, it was just a different cultural mindset entirely. We, we look at very much individual responsibility, which we should. But if, but in the ancient times. If, if someone in our community was just going off the handle, being chaotic, going around, you know, doing God knows what, it was our responsibility as the community to bring them to discipline and to restoration. So God would look at the community and he would essentially, and, and don't take this word out of context, he would essentially judge the community. So that tells us one thing. We are responsible for each other. And some of us that have memories in our minds and things that are going on behind closed doors are like, oh, wait a minute. Um, I don't want anybody to be responsible for me. I'll take care of myself, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll take care of my own responsibility. Well, yes, I mean, you should take care of your bills, you should do all those kind of things. But, but what I'm telling you is that God did not give us his spirit for just us. Paul felt such, back to Galatians, Paul felt such responsibility for these Galatians. And he, he was off somewhere else. He could have just wiped his hands clean and said, okay, well, I've done what I need to do. But he says, you know, you came from a situation where you were being controlled by the government through the process of religion. These pagan gods that nothing really ever turned up because of them. It turned out. You had idols in the corner of your homes, and those idols had no power. So then you had Jesus, who we saw had ultimate power, death, resurrection. We know all the things that he did, miracles, amazing preaching, people, you know, demons coming out of people. Just name it, and he is obviously the one with the power. And you're telling me you're scratching your head about, like, um, should I believe this or not? Jesus never went to one person and said, before I heal you, um, have you been have you been doing the Jewish ritual? <laughs> and that's what Paul was saying. Another thing that Paul says is that not only was he so concerned about the spiritual life of the Galatians, he ministered to them while he was suffering. While he was suffering. Now, it doesn't specifically tell us what his ailment was, but, but, but Paul does give us a clue in this passage. And he says, hey, you know, I know that if, if you could have, you would have gouged, and it's kind of gross, but if you could have gouged your own eyes out and gave it to me, then, you know, you would have. Paul's also inferred in other parts of Scripture that he was going blind. And some scholars, okay, it's going to be hard one to talk myself out of, but I'm going to say it because I believe it's the truth. Some scholars believe that this blindness or sight ailment came from when he was converted bright light. And I, it's hard for me as a pastor to talk my way around that. It's like, well, hold on a minute. You mean Jesus heard him? Yeah. I don't know how to explain that. I mean, like, not harmed him. 
But look how joyful Paul is throughout this whole thing. The fact is that he was in the midst of killing Christians on his road to Damascus. And then God changed his life and gave him such a great meaning and purpose. And he's saying, you know what? I think I can handle some, some sight issues. He had, he had so many people coming and ministering to him while he was in prison. He had everything stacked against him. His, his reputation, and he's had to defend his reputation here in Scripture. His reputation, the fact that he was infirmed or you know, ill in some way. But yet he went to Gal Galatia, and while he was saying, hey, I know I was probably a burden on you, I still had to make sure that God, that, that the... Uh, the goodness of God was being displayed and proclaimed. But maybe this is part of it. What would you do if you're in this village or in this city and this just lovely, wonderful, gentle, kind man came in talking about Jesus and his first priority was not to become better but to make sure you heard about it too. How would you feel? I think that that would have carried some weight with it. So, he wasn't a man who whined about what he was going through. In fact, we don't hear a whole lot about it. And sometimes you got to kind of search for it. I know if it were me, I would make that the top priority everyone knew. Hey guys, I've been really suffering lately. Just make sure you know, then go on to my next city. Hey, I told them, but I want to make sure you know that I've been suffering. So if you do put me up for the night, it needs to be a soft night. Make sure, because I, I've been suffering. Man, I would play it up, wouldn't you? If someone, if someone raised their hand, like, are you sure about that, what you just preached up? Please don't question me. I'm, I've been suffering. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you, can get, you can get some mileage with that. So, but Paul doesn't <laughs> lead with that. He walks in, and, you know, maybe bumping into stuff. We don't know. Visibly, they visibly understand that he is infirmed with something. And they have to take care of him. And in the midst of this, he apologizes for, hey, if I've cost you any money, if I've uh, made you suffer in any way, I'm sorry, but this is just something I had to get out there. No matter what we're dealing with in life, let us never apologize for pro proclaiming the gospel to people. I hope we don't. Don't ever apologize for who God has created you to be. Now, I didn't say who you are. Did you hear that? I used my word very carefully there. Because there are some times in life when I am not who God has created me to be. God didn't create, create me to be someone that was bitter, unforgiving. God wasn't up there in his workshop and saying, Ooh, I have an extra jar of anger here. I have to give that to you. And he does use jars, by the way. That's what I hear. I do. <coughs> So, there's a difference. So, 
Jesus tells us in the parable of the sower what the kingdom of God is going to look like. In the kingdom of God, he's focusing inward here at this point. What, what is going to produce the kingdom of God outside of yourself is a deeply rooted faith that is cultivated, that is watered, that is grown, that and, 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 <laughs> that is multiplied. See, the problem with multiplication of our faith is that it's uncomfortable to us. Because we sit around and we point at people and say, I wish they knew about Jesus. That would change their life. There's a part of that that I just said that's evil. Not, not the whole, not the whole like Jesus could change their life part, because he can and he will. But if I re remove myself from that and I walk away the other direction, when I have the ability and I have the deep-rooted soil um, that I can multiply that or I can plant a seed or I can help water or I can just you know, be Jesus in front of them, then there is a part of me that is not living with that deep soil mentality. Right. <clears throat> Or we, we say that's someone else's responsibility. I'm not an evangelist, you say. No, maybe you're not, but I mean, you have cold water. You have, you have gifts and abilities that God has given you for such a time as this. Right. Oh, but they'll reject him. I know. I, know. I mean, I, I can see the way that they live. They'll... See, we always want to go with the low-hanging fruit. They're just about one step away from Jesus. I'm in. But man, if they're far away, come quote from Jesus, I, I don't want to have anything to do with that. At the very least, we could bring them one step closer by by displaying Jesus in front of them. And to them. Yeah. The kingdom of God is this plant deeply rooted. In the book of Galatians, chapter 4, these, these Gentiles were not having an opportunity to get this deeper seated, rooted faith. Because someone came and scattered the seed and they said, Well, you're, you're, you'll be good, I'm going to leave. It was this lack of discipleship that led them to believe that, that pleasing God was just about this task list. Things that I need to get accomplished before I die. And people came along and started, they were being false teachers. And they believed it because it kind of sounded a little like it was true. And their, and their faith was not... Deeply rooted enough to be able to thwart that away and say, no, that ain't right. We, I, I always get up here and talk about the importance of cultivating your faith, but I, I think we all nod our head, yeah, that's, that's really good, that's really good. Amen, preacher, man, you keep going. But it's not just because I want you to be stop doing weird and stupid stuff. It's because there's a world around you that is relying on you to grow in your faith. Yeah. And if you're sitting here today in the congregation saying, like, man, you're being really judgmental of me. No, I'm not. Don't put that on me. Maybe that's conviction of the Holy Spirit. Talking to you and saying, you need to change. God loves you so much. And I read it somewhere that he loved us so much that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him would have eternal life. Amen. He did not come into the world to condemn the world, but so that the whole world could be saved through him. 
I didn't make that up. I, mean, I, read, I read it somewhere. It's a cool book. So, where are we at in our process? Of... <laughs> okay, time out. Can I, can I take a little tangent for just for a second? We got my kids new Bibles. And, I, and, and they're, my son's going to camp. Uh, so he needs a Bible. It'd be great to get my daughter a Bible. Because, you know, Bibles. <laughs> so they were in the back of the car. It was just so sweet. You know, they were reading... They're reading next to each other, they're both being silent. And then the children came out. The children in them came out. My daughter looks over at my son and says, What chapter are you in? My son says, Oh, whatever chapter he's in. Ha! I'm farther. <laughs> <laughs> I'm farther than you are. Although it was kind of cute, it was also a little frustrating, but let us not, and I, I use that illustration because sometimes we feel like this is a race in that God can't possibly use us until we are fully feeling secure with our, our, our faith walk. I, have I gotten far enough to be able to multiply? It becomes a competition. At least I'm not as bad at that. Bad illustration, but you get the idea. Today, we have an opportunity, and I'm, I'm going to bring praise to whoever's going up here. Uh, we have an opportunity to unite with one another here in just a moment. Unite with one another here, but all over the world, and over past, present, and future. That's what communion's about, by the way. To not only reflect on the, the sacrifice that Jesus made, but we're doing something together that all disciples are asked to do because it's a unified event. Like if I can connect with someone right now, if I can do the same thing right now that someone in Haiti is doing right now, going through their context and that turmoil, that it makes me feel a little bit closer to the Christians that are suffering there. I can connect with the suffering of Jesus, I'm feeling closer to Jesus. So we're going to sing, and we'll take communion here in a little bit, but um, we'll, we'll guide you through those things.
So Jesus was, was with his disciples, and they're having a meal together. It was a wonderful bonding time for them. And in the midst of this meal, he took the bread, and he raised it to heaven, and he broke it, and he passed it out among them. And he said to them, this is my body, broken for you for the forgiveness of sin. Take and eat. And when you do, do so in remembrance of me. So they did. he took the cup and he raised it to heaven and he passed it out among them and he said this is my blood shed for you may it preserve you blameless into everlasting life take and drink and when you do do so in remembrance of me Father thank you for this reminder today you are so good, and we thank you for your kingdom being birthed in us. We love you, Lord. We give you all the praise. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and sing just that chorus? I feel alone. 